Well, good evening and welcome to our study of the Akedah. We have an unusual study uh, on the Word of God, and whenever we do that, we always want to invite Him to accomplish His purpose. We wouldn't presume to guess, but there is a purpose in your watching that God has. That's the reason we're together right now. So let's ask Him to bless it. Father, we just thank You for this time together. We thank You for Your Word. We thank You for this opportunity to learn more about You and what You would have of us in response. As we commit this hour and ourselves in the name of Yeshua, our precious Lord indeed. Amen. Okay. Well, we're going to explore what's called the Akedah in Hebrew. It's, it, it's actually a study of uh, primarily Genesis chapter 22. And uh, this is the famous episode of Abraham's offering of Isaac. And one reason we're using this as a, a standalone front end introductory study is because it's recognized as probably the archetype, if you will, the ultimate macro code, if you will, or a, a type is an anticipatory model where the, the, the narrative is more, it's a historical actual event on the one hand, but it carries far more meaning than just the narrative would imply. And so that's why it's what we call a type. Now, uh, that's where obviously Abraham is challenged uh, as a test. The test was real. He was to give Isaac back to God. And the test was presumably designed to uh, prove his faith. Uh, Ishmael had been sent away, and now after a long wait, Isaac was to be given back to God. And this event is called the Akedah. Now, it may not surprise you that this story in the Bible has a lot of people objecting to it. It's a very difficult passage if you look at it too narrowly. And the, the rabbis have all kinds of objections. In the end, I have to strip the Akedah of its literal elements. Looking at it as story involving a real man and a real son is just too terrible. The whole concept, the father was to take his son and make him an offering, I mean, that, that shatters our sensibilities. And in fact, some rabbis even go further. On a literal level, the text teaches us that the binding of Isaac is a test of Abraham's faith. God needs to know if Abraham and his descendants will be able to fulfill their part of the covenantal relationship. And yet this answer is so problematic. What kind of a God would ask a parent to sacrifice a child as a test? It doesn't make sense. There must be something more than that. And that's just a quote of, of senior rabbis at synagogues. There's a number of these that we could draw upon. It doesn't surprise us. Because if we read this story naively, uh, it's disturbing. And yet, if you take the Bible seriously, it really happened. It's a pivotal event for a number of reasons. So that's what we're facing here. But let's learn as we go a little bit about hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is your theory of understanding or interpretation of the Scripture. In Hosea chapter 12, verse 10, God gives us a clue here. God says, I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. And uh, that's a strange term. What God is revealing here is God uses rhetorical devices, figures of speech. He uses those things to communicate. <coughs> and they're not just idioms, they're serious things. Do you know how many different types there are in the Scripture? Let's look at a few. Figure, figures of speech, you might call them. You've got a simile. It's a resemblance, a declaration that one thing rep resembles another. Uh, you have an allegory, comparison by representation. You have a metaphor, which is a representation, a declaration that one thing is or represents another. And then you have hypostasis, which is more a, a subtle one of those. But the one we're going to focus on is a, what's called a type a figure or example of something future. It's a pre-acting out of a future event, in a sense. That's called a type. And the Bible is full of types, but we're going to examine the archetype of them all. And uh, so, do you know how many different types of figures of speech are in the Bible? Over 200. 
And they're all identified, cataloged, and identified for, for you as appendix in some of our materials. And of course, there's analogies and so forth. Now, what makes this interesting to me as an information scientist, this is evidence of design. Throughout the Bible, we have what we typically classify as microcodes. Yachts and tittles, the little subtleties of, of, the, of the text itself that sometimes reveal something far beyond the first impression. I collect those. I sometimes call it hermeneutia, little things that impact your respect and awe for the text itself. We'll co collectively call those macrocodes. But we're shifting to something larger, which is called macrocodes. And this is, it will include, among other things, things like types and so forth. There are also things that we won't be getting into, but you should be aware of them, called metacodes. The DNA code as a source of life has huge biblical relevance, by the way. And the fact that we are in a digital universe, is, these are all legitimate topics that we derive from the text in broader terms. But we're going to focus this hour on the archetype example of, of what we call a type. But let's take a look at Genesis 22 and start to unpack it here a little bit. It starts with verse 1, And it came to pass after these things, that God did tempt Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham, he said, here, Behold, here I am. He said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Now, by the time you get to Genesis 22, Abram had really learned his lesson. There were a lot of false starts and other things that, has hap that have happened prior to Genesis. By the time you get to 22, Abraham responds that the very next morning to undertake what God asked him to do. But I want to highlight something else. When you study your Bible, you'll discover there's something else that occurs in the text. The, the, the theologians call it the law of first mention. The first time a word or a thought is mentioned in the Bible usually turns out to be profoundly significant. And what many people don't realize is that um, he says, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. In this chapter, in this verse, is the first place in the Bible that the word love appears. And it, it, that's, I don't want to make a big thing of it, but it's subtle. But it's something you'll discover as you study your Bible, the law first mentioned. The first time an idea comes up, it turns out to be usually very definitive. And of course, that should echo in your mind John 3, 16 and so forth. But they're going to go to the land of Moriah to offer uh, Isaac. Now, notice verse 3, the next verse. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. Not a day went by. Okay, God, that's what you want me to do. Abraham went right to it. We need to think, realize what's going on here. And he saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place which God had told him. You know, you could not imagine a test that more severe than the one that's just been imposed upon Abraham. And no obedience could have been more perfect than Abraham's. So this is a model in several ways we're going to discover. I want you to notice, though, for some reasons we'll bring out later, how many people went on the trip. There's Abraham and Isaac and two young men. You got that picture. Four people and uh, the donkey and so on. Now, they're going from Be Beersheba in the south, and uh, they're heading to a, where, what we know today is Jerusalem. In those days, it was Salem. It was a Jebusite settlement. And uh, it's a three-day journey, by the way. And that three days is going to prove to be significant. One of the things as a student you might do is, in a notebook, keep track of all the places that three days show up to be uh, relevant. And so, and so uh, God had... Why did God have Abraham make this offering in that specific piece of geography. That's a three-day journey, 50 miles or whatever. Interesting. Well, we'll go on in verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. That's another phrase you'll be tuned to as you study your Bible. When, Ab when someone lifted up their eyes, it's a way of emphasize, emphasis. It's, it's a way of saying what's coming is very significant. 
He lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife. They went both of them together. But the Hebrew actually says they both went in agreement, interestingly enough. Now here's a place where most of us are victims of our little Sunday school coloring books. Because we always visualize, and most artists presume, they see uh, Isaac as a child. He was not a child. He was probably 30 years of age, and that may shock you. And you'll see why shortly. And the Hebrew there says they went both of them together, but actually both in agreement. And uh, the image that's being pro, uh, pr uh, projected here is the image of a son who said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Which will echo from Luke 4, uh, 22, 42 and other places. But notice what he tells these two young men. They're going to wait at the bottom of the hill. The donkey and the two men are waiting at the bottom of the hill. Abraham and Isaac are going up the hill. And he says, I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. One of the things you're going to realize as, we, as this develops is Abraham's attitude was that God has a problem. God wants me to offer my son. That gives God a problem. Why? Because God has promised Abraham that his son would have children. And so if you want me to kill him, God, you've got a problem. You're going to have to raise him from the dead because I know you will because I know you keep your promises. You need to, it's hard for us to try to capture his mindset there, but clearly you'll discover Abram had no doubt that Isaac would be restored. It was that confidence that enabled him to pass the test. You with me? That turns out to be very, very important as we go. He says, I and the son will come again to you. And so we go on here. Now, I love this one. Isaac spoke unto Abram, his father, said, uh, my father? He said, yeah, here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? You know, I, 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 Isaac wants to get the picture here. We got the wood. You know, the donkey's back down there. We need a lamb. Where's the, you know, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And I, I, I love verse 8. Abram said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And in my early days of Bible study, I always figured that that was Abraham giving the kid a stall. You know, God will provide. God will provide. I didn't read it carefully. Notice what he says. My son, God will provide who? Himself. A lamb for a bird offering. And as we unfold this thing, you're going to discover that another father will be offering his son on that very spot some several thousand years later. And this is all an enactment in advance. And you'll discover that Abraham knew he was acting out a prophecy before it's all over. Many people don't realize that as we go here. So anyway, they both went in agreement. Okay. God will provide who? Himself. I love that. And they came to the place which God had told him of. Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Wow. See, a true worshiper of God holds nothing back from God, but obediently gives him what he asks, trusting that he will provide. Do you realize the perfection of Abraham's performance here? What an example to all of us in our own way. And when we, get to he when we examine the epistle to Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 19, it'll, it'll amplify all of this when we get there. Now let's take a look where they went. They went to a place called Mount Moriah. And we have a, a, a profile here, a topological thing. It's, uh, Moriah is actually a ridge system. It starts about 600 meters above sea level. It rises up to about 740 meters above sea level, which is the area that we think of as the Temple Mount. And then it, it, but that's not the peak. The peak is further to north, and we'll amplify this a little bit. Uh, I might notice 
that there's a mountain to the left called Mount Zion. There's a Tropian Valley, which is now filled, but it was a, a, a valley originally. And then we have Mount of Olives to the east and the uh, 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 Kidron Valley between. And so to the south, we have the Hinnom Valley. And that's, that's the area we're dealing with. But uh, Salem is down at the south end. And obviously, Abraham didn't offer him in town. He went further north, out of town, is the point I'm making. That's, Salem was a settlement of the, Jebus of the Jebusites. The thrashing for Varuna that later David will purchase is at that saddleback, apparently. But at the very top is the peak, a place uh, uh, the, where the Akedah takes place. And if you amplify this, that's a place that we know as Golgotha. And I hold the view, for a lot of reasons, that's exactly where Abraham offered. See, the, the Jews have a tradition that Abraham offered Isaac where the temple stood, but there's no evidence of that. There's, the, the indication is further to the north, it's up at a place called Golgotha. But that's a whole other study. I won't take the time here. Let's look at verse 11. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of the heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. You notice you always have to tell men twice. You girls know that, right? Eli, Eli. You know, it's always twice. The angel said, <laughs> called him and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. He said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Do you think that was a surprise to Abraham? No. He was being obedient. Do you think it was a surprise to God? Do you think he was proving something to God that God didn't know? Uh-uh. Do you know who the, the uh, re receipt, uh, the re receptor of that information is? You and me. This is to demonstrate to us perfect obedience. That's the one. That, that's, that's the performance. That's the audience for the performance. Wasn't people there. It's us now, strangely. And there's more coming. And so, now, it's interesting in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, it speaks of he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Abraham did not withhold his son. And that's why Paul could write here that he, he did not spare Ephesiato in the, in the Greek. Uh, his own son, but gave it or delivered him up for us all. And the same form of the Greek word, same Greek word is used in, with Abraham in the Septuagint. Thou hast not spared thy beloved son in Genesis 22, 12. That same word is used in the Greek there. If you study Leviticus chapter 1, verse 11, where it gives you instructions, it says, Thou shalt kill it on the side of the altar northward before the Lord, and the priest Aaron's son shall sprinkle his blood. When you're getting instructions about giving an offering, you'll notice that it's northward. It's outside the camp. It's in a clean place. This conforms to all of that. In Leviticus 6.12 and 10.14, you shall carry forth without the camp, in other words, outside the camp of Israel, unto a clean place, in Numbers 19.9 and so forth. And so... It's interesting, in Isaiah, which descri describes the crucifixion of Christ, it says, He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. That probably rings familiar to you. He was made his grave with the wicked. That's um, plural, be, but it's not the two thieves. It's the location of the grave. Many people miss that. We always think, well, you're talking about the two thieves. No, he made his grave... The body was buried among the wicked, really? And he was the rich in his death. And what's really interesting about this, the word wicked there is in the plural. The word rich is in the singular. These subtleties start to emerge as you start studying this location carefully. And uh, in Luke 23, we see that, behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor. And he was a good man and uh, just. The same had not consented to the counsel and deed of them, meaning the Sanhedrin. He was of Arimathea, the city of the Jews, and he, all, he also himself waited for the kingdom of God. This is Luke's summary of Joseph of Arimathea so far. Are you with me? And he's an interesting guy. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. He's a disciple of Christ. He was driven into concealment due to his, the plots on his life because he defended Jesus before the Sanhedrin openly. He did that earlier. And they had, he had a, they had a contract on him. So he's gone into hiding, okay? His appearance before Pilate, 
that morning, uh, that uh, uh, morning after the, uh, 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 or of the, uh, uh, not sure the morning that that evening when he was crucified, may have been a shock to the Jewish for for for, uh, for um, Joseph to show up to go to Pilate to get the body must have shocked the Jewish league because because uh, Arimathea had was hiding. You say where, where am I getting all that? I'll show you where I'm getting all that. After and after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. And he came therefore and took the body of Jesus. Now, this is interesting because in your Bible, in your King James Bible, there's an error. And I'm glad, I'm glad we, we pointed this out to the ISV people and they agreed and made the change. It says secretly for fear of the Jews. That implies that that's an adverb, but it's not. It's not an adverb. It is secreted. He was secreted. He wasn't just secretly a, a disciple. He was actually formally in hiding. And that's why it's such a shock to Pilate. He, he obviously had several, we know several things about him. He had to be next of kin to get the body. But the fact that he even had access to Pilate tells you he was a heavy. Not everybody could get to Pilate. He did. Okay. And of course, Pilate's amazed. He says, you've got this brand new tomb that's built for you and your family, and you're going to give it to this criminal? And Joseph says, oy vey, it's just for the weekend. <laughs> I just thought I have to work that in. I can't <laughs> Okay. But seriously, moving on here. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first night came at the, to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about a hundred pound weight. And, they, and then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. Okay, you with me so far? Now, if you look at Golgotha, we know that Joseph's new tomb was hewn out of a rock adjacent to the very spot that criminals were put to death. But you got a you got a Levitical problem because the grave can't be among; it has to be carved out of rock if there's other graves around. You see, the stony sides of the tomb, now of the new tomb, uh, the clean place where Jesus was laid, were part of Malefactor's Hill. But because it was carved in the rock, it was Levitically con considered clean. So his body is with the rich man and with the wicked in the hour of death. So it's it was in Arimathea's own tomb his private one, and yet it was among the wicked because the, the, the region there is the Malefactor's Hill. So his grave is the property of a rich man, yet the rocks which form the partition between his tomb and that of the Malefactor's are themselves part of Golgotha. Okay, you with me? If you've been there, if you visited, this is what you see. Now when they present that, when you visit there, they don't oversell it. They, they, they let, let's say this is just typical. But if you study this carefully, there are literally over 18 specific specifications that identify this as being the scriptural location. I happen to believe, doesn't mean I'm right, but I'm convinced that this actually is. I, I think most of these things are, most traditions are wrong. This is one place, strangely, uh, I think this is very legitimate in that tomb. And the most important thing about that tomb when you look through there is empty. He's risen. Now the garden tomb, as it's called, it was General Charles George Gordon, had quite a career. He was commissioned in 1852. He served in the Crimean War, distinguished himself in the Taipin Rebellion uh, in 1860, diplomatic and military missions in England and Europe through 74, governor of the Sudan in 1877. He served the British government in India, China, Mauritius, and South Africa from 1880 to 1883. You with me so far? Okay. He discovered the garden tomb in Jerusalem in 1883. And there's this whole story behind that that's well known. The point that I want to, what startled me, when I was doing my commentary for Leviticus, I had the privilege of getting my hands on. The classic commentary on Leviticus is one by Andrew Bonar, okay? And uh, so, Andrew Bonar's commentary on Leviticus describes the detailed specifications of the tomb drawn strictly from the biblical texts. You with me so far? What I noticed, though, is that Bonar's commentary on Leviticus was published in 1846. 
In other words, 37 years before the garden tomb was discovered. And that stunned me. Because when you read Bonar and you see, and you know the garden tomb, it fits so perfectly. It startled me to realize, no, Bonar wrote his commentary on it from the biblical text, not from having discovered the garden tomb. So I share that with you as uh, something that is being, uh, be aware of. I think that's exciting. So, well, let's get back to Genesis 22 at verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. I want you to notice that Abraham names the place with a prophetic label. Abraham knew that what he was doing was acting out a prophecy. How much he knew, how well did he understand, I have no idea. But it's clear that he understood that he was a God's pawn here in an enactment of something that was yet future. And did he know that the Messiah himself would be uh, uh, given as a, on that spot? I don't, I'm not suggesting that. And uh, so we've got a substitutionary ram here and a, a name only relevant in prophetic perspective. Abraham knew he was acting out a prophetic ritual. And Jesus would make reference to this back in John chapter 8, verse 56. Jesus would later say, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. That's a glib line that Jesus pulls off in John 8. What on earth is Jesus talking about? When did Abraham see Jesus' day? It's my surmise that that's an allusion to Abraham's acting out this uh, type, as we call it, on, uh, on, uh, in Genesis 22. We're just getting warmed up here. Hang with me. In the Mount of the Lord it shall be seen, is what he labels this place. When we look at the commentary that Paul writes of the epistle to the Hebrews, he makes an interesting comment that we need to understand. Paul tells us, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. See, the writer to Hebrews is pointing out that Abraham knew he would be raised from the dead. He, 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 he counted that God was able to raise him up. See, that... that that is the thing when you say, what saved Abraham? It was his belief in the resurrection of Isaac, strangely enough. Okay. When we get to Revelation chapter 5, John tells us, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Now, you and I have no idea what's going on, but John understood what was going on. He's, he said, And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. That's an opening generality. There's going to be an exception, of course. Now, we don't understand what's going on, but John did. He says, I, I wept much. I sobbed convulsively, is what it actually says. Because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. It had to be a kinsman of Adam. It had to be a man. And fortunately, there was a man that had prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And John says, I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood the Lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of it. Who is that? There's only one person that gets that title in Scripture, right? The Messiah, indeed. The Lamb as it had been slain. Wow. Well, back to Genesis 22. The angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of the heaven the second time. 
and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. By the way, those are two groups, but we'll leave that here. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. So God again confirms his covenant with Abraham, which is from Genesis 15 and Genesis 17 earlier. His descendants would be numerous like the stars on the one hand, like the sand of the seashore. And some people think there's two different groups there, the ethnic ones and the ones by faith. And God added another element. Abraham's descendants would be victorious over the cities of their Canaanite enemies. And that was done by Joshua in the conquest forthcoming. But getting to verse 18, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. And then we have verse 19. I want you to notice verse 19. We're going to come back to that later. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose up and went together into Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. And we'll come back to that verse. I've got some things I want to postpone for right now. And it came to pass after these things that was told to Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah hath also borne children unto thy brother Nahor, Huz his firstborn, Buz his brother, Kemuel the father of Ram, and Chechad, and Hazo, and uh, Pildash, and uh, Jidla, and Bethuel. And uh, Bethuel begot Rebekah, and these eight Milcah did bear to Nahor, Abraham's brother, and his concubine whose name was uh, Ruma, also bear also Teba, Graham. So there's a family tree here, reports from the east, from his family in the east, at Nahor. At, uh, Na brother, we'll look at that here in a minute. And so, uh, let's just go ahead. I want to skip chapter 23. That's the death of Sarah, and it takes place. The next chapter is Genesis 24. And you and I are going to regard this as a continuation of Genesis 22. Because I want you to notice something here. The Genesis, in Genesis 24, the mission is to get a bride for Isaac. Okay? It starts off in chapter 24, verse 1, Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had. Notice this guy. He's unnamed here. I'll come back to his name in a minute. He said to his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had. View him as like his business partner. Okay? He said... Uh, uh, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. Now, so you need to understand, Abraham's confident in the Lord's promise that he has his chief servant swear an oath to find a wife for Isaac from Abraham's native land that's 450 miles away. Now, he's the eldest servant. That's the way he's labeled here. It turns out, all through the Scripture, when someone is in the role, typologically, of the Holy Spirit, he's always an unnamed servant. Unnamed servant. Now, what's interesting here, here's a case, by the time you're in Genesis 24, you can go back and look at Genesis 15 and find out what his name was. It's not mentioned here, but you can figure out what it is. His name was Eliezer, which means comforter. Now, is that, is, is, you, you see the plot thickening here, okay? And so, Eliezer's putting his hand under the patriarch's thigh was a solemn sign that if the oath were not carried out, the children who would be born to Abraham would avenge the servant's unfaithfulness. And notice that the servant appears to be nameless. Do you know why he's nameless? Because of John 16, 13, Jesus says the Holy Spirit will never testify of himself. Let's remember that. Let's remember that. Because we're going to run into an unnamed servant when we get into the book of Ruth and uh, so forth. But he continues giving instructions. He says, but thou shalt go into my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said, and peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said to him, beware that Thou that thou bring not my son thither again. Now, Terah's family, take a look at this. Terah was the father of Abraham. And uh, under Terah, you had Abraham, Nahor, Haran, and Sarai. Sarai was his sister, interesting enough. Okay. She's the daughter of his father, but not the daughter of his mother. And so she, so she becomes his wife. 
Sarai becomes Abraham's wife. And the names are changed, as you know, from Abraham to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah. The only change is a hey put into it, which is a, a breath, the Spirit of, of God put in there. And as you go through this, you realize that Bethuel had Rebecca and Laban. And uh, so Rebecca will turn out to end up becoming Isaac's wife. That's what's going to happen here uh, as a result of the visit that's being organized. Just to give you a perspective. We could go more and more into that, but let's not get distracted here. Leah and Rachel are under uh, Laban, and they, of course, become uh, Jacob's target then, and so forth. But let's get back to verse 7. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. Strange emphasis here. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear to him concerning the matter. And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed. For all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. And uh, so... And you can get, you can follow, he received a precise answer to his prayer, it turns out, as you'll discover, of course. Now these ten camels, I think, are an interesting clue. I believe they somehow link to the ten virgins in Matthew 25, but you, I'll let you take that on as an ancillary study on your own. Let's take a look here at verse 11. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of men of the city come to draw out the water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast shown kindness to my master. So it's interesting how Eliezer trusted the Lord to grant him specific leading. And so, uh, the, uh, and by the way, to water ten thirsty camels is a lot of work, because they guzzle enormous amounts of water. So that's a non-trivial thing. And it came to pass before he, done, before he had done speaking, that behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. The damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had any man known her, and she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. Okay. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him to drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. So that's known as going the extra mile, isn't it? But boy, did it change her destiny. And the man wondering at her held his peace, to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight, and two bracelet from her hands of ten shekels weight of gold. And uh, we could get into the details, but that's not critical for us. And said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee. Is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? And she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. She said moreover unto him, We have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. And so, uh, so he had not only had a place to stay, but he also had food for the camels and so on. And the man bowed his head and worshipped the Lord. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren, and the damsel ran and told them of her mother's house of these things. And Rebekah had a brother, and his name was Laban, and Laban ran out unto the man unto the well. And uh, it may sound strange, but it was the role of the brother to be the negotiator here. 
And it came to pass when he saw the earring and the bracelets upon his sister's hands, and when he heard the words of Re Rebekah, his sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, that he came unto the man, and behold, he stood by the camels at the well. And so uh, these dazzling presents were increased his haste, of course, and his interest here. And he said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. Wherefore standest thou without? I have prepared the house and room for the camels. And the man came into the house, and he ungirded his camels, and gave straw and provender for the camels, and water to wash his feet, and the men's feet that were with him. And uh, there was set meat before him to eat. But he said, I will not eat until I have told mine errand. And he said, Speak on. He said, I am Abraham's servant. And the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he has become great. He hath given him flocks, and herds, and silver, and gold, and men servants, and maid servants, and camels, and asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old. And, and unto him hath he given all that he hath. And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell. But thou shalt go to my father's house, and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son. And I said, Master, peradventure the woman will not follow me. And he said unto me, The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee, and prosper thy way, and thou shalt take the wife of my son from my kindred, my father's house. Then shalt thou be clear from this thy, my oath, when thou comest to my kindred, and if, they not, and if they give not to thee one, thou shalt be clear from my oath. So I came this day unto the well, and said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, if, I now, if now thou do prosper my way which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin cometh to draw uh, water, I say unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water of thy pitcher to, eh, to drink. And she say to me, Both drink thou, and I will also draw for thy camels. And let the same be the woman whom the Lord hath appointed out for my master's son. And before I had done speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder, and she went down to the well and drew water. And I said to her, let me, let me drink, I pray thee. And she made haste and let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give thy camels also. And I drank, and she made the camels drink also. And I asked her and said, Whose daughter art thou? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bare unto him. And I put the earring upon her face and the bracelets upon her hands. I bowed my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord, of God, Lord God of my master Abraham, which led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter unto his son. And now if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. See, in that society, the woman's brother gave his sister in marriage. And that's why Laban, Rebekah's brother, was the negotiator of the marriage contract here. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceedeth from the Lord, we cannot speak unto thee good or bad. Behold, Rebekah is before thee, take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord hath spoken. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard the, their words, he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, and gave them to Rebekah, and gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. Those are called gifts of the Spirit, maybe, huh? And they did eat and drink. He and the men that were with him tarried all night. And they rose up in the morning. And he said, Send me away unto my master. And her brother and her mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at, at the least ten. After that she shall go. And he said unto them, Hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the damsel and inquire of her, at her mouth. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Wilt thou go with this man? She says, I will go. And they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. Interesting enough. Then blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy said possess the gate of those which hate them. And Rebekah rose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels, and followed the man, and the servant took Rebekah and went his way. You with me so far? Now we get to verse 62. Isaac came from the way of the well Lahai Roy, for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac went out to, never mind, it's about 450 miles, he just put behind us here. And Isaiah went out to mediate in the field at the eventide, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. 
And uh, she cast down, let, fell prostrate for, for it. And she said to, unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? The servant had said, It is my master. Therefore he, she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things he had done. And Isaac brought her unto his mother Sarah's tent, and took Rebekah, became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's uh, death. And uh, we can talk about the veil and so forth. That was uh, uh, when a stranger comes, that was typical for her to draw her face and so forth. The typology I want you to be sensitive to, Genesis 22 and 24, Abraham is in the role of the father. Okay, Isaac is in the role of the son in both cases. Eliezer is in the role of the Holy Spirit to gather a bride for the son. Do you, do you, see, what, you see where I'm going? Okay. Now, I want to go back now and re-examine one verse back in Genesis 22 that we slept over when we went through the first time. In verse 19 of Genesis 22, they're up there. The ram has just been substituted. They've offered the ram. And you get to verse 19. It says, So Abraham returned unto his young men. How many young men were waiting at the bottom of the bill? Two. Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. Three day, a three-day journey, right? And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Do you notice something missing in that verse? Where's Isaac? Where is Isaac? Now, don't misunderstand me. I jumped to the same conclusion you do. They all went home. The thing was finished. They offered the, the substitutionary ram. Abraham returned unto his young men down there. I am sure Isaac didn't hang around. He went with him. It's not what it says. I want you to notice something very strange here. The name of Isaac ain't here. And if you're paying attention, if you're being precise, that should bother you. you, you it's not that we're trying to make a case that he wasn't there. That's not my point. But it's interesting that he seems to be edited out of the record from the time that he's offered until he's united with his bride two chapters later. Where is Isaac? Isaac is personally edited out of the record from the time he is offered until he is united with his bride by the well of Lahai Roy. Two chapters later. Lahai Roy means the well of the living one who sees me. And so, for what that's worth. The marriage model. We see it profiled for us here. We're talking about Gentile brides all through all this kind of thing. Do you know how many Gentile brides are in the Bible, by the way? Eve, Eve, you can regard her as that. Rebecca and Isaac we're looking at here. We've got Asenath and Joseph in Egypt. We've got Zipporah and Moses in, in Midian. We've got Rahab and Solomon. And Rahab, by the way, is the mother of Boaz. We'll get to that tomorrow. And Ruth and Boaz, of course. And what's fascinating is of, the, of these Gentile brides, none of them have their death recorded. I'm not saying they didn't die, don't misunderstand me, but it's just a, a screwball. I find it fascinating that the Gentile brides in these models do not have a death recorded. They obviously died, don't misunderstand me. Just like Melchizedek, I think that he was without days because the, 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 the writer um, in uh, Hebrews 5 sort of makes a point of what's recorded, not that he didn't die. People misunderstand some of that. See, the Jewish wedding is the model we're going to be studying. The whole idea of a betrothal, a payment of a purchase price, set apart and sanctified. And then the bridegroom departs to the father's house, prepares a room addition. The bride prepares for his eminent return, not knowing when he comes back. The surprise regathering is there. Then the hoopah, the wedding itself. And then there's a seven-day marriage supper. We need to understand the ancient model if you're really going to follow much of what's going on behind the scenes here. But the marriage certainly has been filled. The covenant was established in 1 Corinthians 11. The purchase price was established in 1 Corinthians 6. The bride set apart in Ephesians 5 and a number of other places. Reminded of the covenant in 1 Corinthians 11. And then the bridegroom left for the father's house. The escort to accompany him upon his return to gather his bride in 1 Thessalonians. We have that, what we call the harpazo, right? The thing I want you to discover for yourself is that the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. It's one book. I often threaten that we're going to have an evening where we're going to tear out the page in the Bible that's unnecessary. That'll smoke out all the fundamentalists. 
And then with great ceremony, we'll tear out the page between the Old and New Testament. It's one book, 66 books, penned by over 40 guys. So with that, uh, so, uh, you can go ahead and in your notes, you should find a list of discussion questions that you can go ahead and chew in your small groups. But you and I can just close with a word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for this incredible enactment that was literally occurring so long ago and yet becomes a model for our study. We're staggered as we realize the extremes you've gone to to establish and communicate the redemption that you've provided for us in the person of our Lord and Savior. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We pray, Father, that you would enlighten each of us what you would have of us in response to these things as we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservation. In Jesus' name indeed, amen.